All right, everybody. Well, hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you are uh, dialing in or watching this from. I know we have people not only in the United States, but from all across the globe watching in and dialing in. Hope you guys all had a wonderful weekend. It is Monday, February 9th. It's hard to believe. Really, February is almost a, uh, actually over a third done. So uh, hopefully you guys are all doing something. We are uh, actually still in Dallas today. We just wrapped up our Dallas Note Buying for Dummies workshop here at the Embassy Suites in Irvine. What a great group of people. Got to have a lot of fun, a lot of content, and uh, getting a lot of people excited about buying notes. So uh, it's been fun reading the emails coming in from everybody that attended, people doing their uh, social uh, media stuff, getting things rock and rolling. We had quite a few people respond that they've already got investors lined up to do some deals. So. Definitely excited about the call. Uh, I want to thank the, uh, we had 225 people registered for the call. Uh, I see we are uh, about halfway there with everybody registering in with more people, a couple more people just signed up. So uh, as always, everybody, um, I'm going to ask you to keep your questions relevant and on point with the subject tonight. But before we dive in and bring in my buddy and uh, good friend, Joel Markovitz. Joel, you want to call with us right now? Hello. There you go. Are you here? And you're, are you here in a living color? Well, something, some, some derivative thereof. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, there's always a lot of questions about people who say, uh, "Who's on the call with us today?" We've got real estate investors, obviously, looking to get into the note side. People are a little frustrated with the REO fix and flip side. We do have a lot of note investors who've been buying first, seconds, uh, owner finance notes, performing and non-performing a call. And we also have people who are interested in making the jump or actually diving in and getting their feet wet in some sort of, uh, for, uh, some sort of fashion. Uh, so we've got a good group on the call. Uh, as always, these calls are recorded, and I do upload them to my Vimeo account. So if you want to get access to this recording and all others from the Monday Note, along with other videos, you can go to vimeo.com uh, slash weclosenotes.com. You can go and subscribe to that. And then you'll be alerted to any of these videos that we do. That if you can't make it, uh, that's where we store all our videos. And uh, this way you'll be aware of things along with these Monday notes. You also have access to the note nuggets that we do and other training phone calls. So take a second. Go ahead and uh, subscribe there. I can't tell you how many times I get emails from people like, hey, I missed the call. Can I get the replay? So go ahead and save yourself some grief. Go to Vimeo.com, subscribe, and you'll have access to everything. Uh, on another note, I uh, also ask you all to connect with me via LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram, definitely, Google+, and then uh, Vimeo, and then Pinterest as well. Stay connected because we do a variety of things with deals, content, uh, investment uh, opportunities, venture opportunities as well. Uh, hey, check me out on one Scott Carson at uh, Instagram. Last weekend we offered prizes up to a few people, and uh, we're mailing those out today and tomorrow to those, the first 10 to subscribe. We'll do the same thing today. So if you're one of the first 10 people to connect with me who is not connected with me, we'll make sure and get you a nice little prize out in the mail. Yes, going to bribe you to connect with me. <laughs> anyway, uh, as always, everybody, 2015 is off rock and rolling. Uh, the workshop was a, a great time. Uh, I always like to share my goals with what's going on, and on your screen you should see two goals, 1,000 and 1,000. I'm sure some of you guys are already tired of me mentioning this, but we are focused on two numbers. Uh, first one being 1,000 people through our workshops, through our home study course, through our virtual workshops even that we plan on having in April. And then the second one, which is our bigger goal, is 1,000 note deals, and uh, we're definitely rocking along on that. Um, we got some counters today, some offers come in. Actually, Joel and I talked about some of this stuff early on, didn't we, Joe? Hello? Markovitz? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I broke up. What did you say? Uh, nothing. Don't worry about it, buddy. <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Tell Donna and the kids and everybody hello for me. All right. Uh, our next upcoming workshop for those that are interested is actually in just a few weeks, just over a month. In St. Louis, the Note Blind for Dummies workshop, March 12th through the 15th. Uh, if you're interested in attending, you can go to weeklosenotes.com. Uh, like I said, it's going to be actually downtown there at the Embassy Suites Downtown Hotel. It is $9.99. That's good for two for one to repeat. Also comes with the home study course. You can sign up at weeklosenotes.com to take advantage of that. 
All right, good, Lloyd. Look, we look forward to seeing you there. All right. Um, you can always connect with other note investors through some of the things we offer up. We have a LinkedIn group that's designed just for note investors. You can go to LinkedIn and under groups search for the note closers group. It's a place for you to be able to post comments, questions, connect with the note investors across the country. All right. Uh, as also, you can check out our note nuggets. We do little videos there. Um, and now let's dive into the heart of the manor. Let me turn everything over to Joel. I got here. Yeah. A lot of pressure. It is a lot of pressure, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Hope your Monday is going well. All right. So I have, uh, hang on here. Let's make sure here. Change presenter. Yes. All right, Joel. There we go. All right. You got, you've got the uh, oh. control there, buddy. You got to accept it. Okay, I said the showing the screen. Can you, can you see my screen? We see the white screen. There we go. There's a spreadsheet. You see something on it? Uh, nope, that's the wrong one. Uh, let me move this then over there. I have three screens, so that's. Aren't you just? There we go. You might want to maximize that now. Yeah. And let's do this. While Jill's pulling it up, everybody, one of the biggest things that uh, we see with investors is they very gun ho especially when they understand the real estate side. Hey, I understand what the property's worth. I understand that I'm getting a decent discount or a great discount, and I'm ready to rock and roll on this. And so they wire the funds, they own it, they get the assignments, they launch it, and they're like, okay. What do I do now? How do I reach out to the borrowers? How do I reach out to uh, the, the people that I'm supposed to be collecting from? What do I do next? And that's why we brought Joel Markovitz on, everybody. Um, Joel is with Landon Financial. Joel, we actually have your uh, slide presentation up here where we can see the next screen. So you want to just go to the, the one screen for you, buddy. Okay. Whoops. Does that work? Well, we're getting what you're seeing exactly. So we got the, the, you may want to just go ahead to one, we're just showing one slide, not two slides at the same time. That way everybody can see it and read it as we go. Okay. There we go. There we go. That's perfect. So, okay. all right. Without further ado, everybody, Joe Margovitz. Hi, good afternoon and good evening, and as Scott said, good morning to some. Um, my name is Joel Markovitz, and I am with Land Home Financial Services. We are a servicing company based out of Southern California. Land Home Financial Services is originally was an origination company based out of Concord, California, which is Northern California. Um, but all of our servicing is done out of Southern California in Orange County, specifically in Costa Mesa. If you've had um, any familiarity with servicing, um, I, I apologize, but I'm going to kind of get a little bit granular on, the, on everything today. And obviously, any questions, fire away as we go. Um, give you a little bit of background about Land Home. Land Home, we, we do custom servicing with, on both performing and non-performing assets. We do a, have a variety of different um, uh, technology pieces that we put to the puzzle. Our, our, the platform that we've selected is, a, is um, called Servicing Director. And Servicing Director, Servicing Director, one of the really key components about it is the fact that it is uh, CFPB compliant. And what I mean by that is Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which as of January 14th, uh, excuse me, January 10th of 2014, became the overriding guiding um, agency that oversees all types of data both, you know, it does student loan debt, it does consumer debt, and it also does um, mortgage debt. So um, we chose servicing director because of the linkage to CFPB and all the different updates that take place. Land Home itself, we are a servicing company, um, but we, we service both first and second, performing, non-performing. We also do loss mitigation. A lot of times people, we, um, get confused that they think servicing is encompassing all of that. We delineate it in two different ways. 
servicing and component servicing and or loss mitigation. The servicing side is the things that are kind of more basic that that you might have um, have with your own mortgage. If you have a mortgage, you'll get a statement every month. You'll get at the end of the year, you'll get a, a, a statement for your taxes. Um, payments will be posted, things of that nature. That's really where servicing is at. Um, the component servicing side is really what takes place when you have a non-performing asset that you're trying to mitigate the loss on, and thus the name loss mitigation. Um, Land Home itself, to give you a little bit of background, besides being based in Northern California, which we spoke of, they've been in, um, in business since 1988. And originally they were a manufactured housing and modular home finance company. Eventually, as the marketplaces have evolved, we became a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Ginnie Mae approved um, seller and servicer. We are a HAMP registered servicer. So if you go in and you're buying any assets and they want to make sure that you have a HAMP servicer to handle those assets, a lot of times the, some of the sellers will be concerned about contingent liability, meaning that if they sell the assets to somebody that they are not going to be held liable for any misdeeds of the, the purchaser of those assets, thus being a HAMP registered servicer and having these other, other certifications. Besides the fact that we're licensed in the, in the um, uh, I think, 49 states at this point in time, it does say 47 in my presentation. We just received our two additional licenses. But the, all of those things go back to allaying any concerns with regard to the seller having concerns about contingent liability. That's really important, uh, Joel. I want to touch base on that because we're starting to see more and more HAMP mods that were created you know, five years ago that the, uh, the borrowers were given interest-only loans for a period of time, fixed rate. They weren't given any really principal reduction from the, the banks. And now that their interest rates are starting to adjust, they're starting to default on their loans. Would you agree to that? Yes, absolutely. The, the most of the, and this kind of dovetails back into what we were doing in 2009 and 2010 um, as Newview Financial Services. We did about 493,000 modifications for city mortgage. And in essence, what took place is that in 2009 and 2010, you modified the loans, you, you reduced the interest rates down to 2%, and they were then fixed for five years. Well, lo and behold, we're now in 2014, 2015, and those that five-year fixed rate is now being readjusted, and it's it's going up to to um, five percent from two percent. Now that doesn't seem like a lot when you you know, gee, five percent—that's really low interest rate. I bought my first house with a ten percent interest rate. Uh, I won't tell you how long ago, but <laughs> it was ten percent. Um, but what that does to an average payment of two hundred thousand dollars, it raises it from approximately seven hundred and thirty-eight dollars a month. A little over 1,100. Wow! And that really knocks a lot of people out. Totally. And uh, for those that don't know, HAM stands for Home Affordability Modification Program. Okay. All right, Joel. Uh, one of the things that's important when you're choosing a servicer, obviously, I'd love for you to choose Land Home, um, but you know, taking a step back, what should your servicer do for you? Your servicer should be able to provide a lot of uh, critical pieces of the puzzle, especially if you're going out there and seeking other people's money, because they're going to want to know exactly what's taking place. And if you don't have a relationship with your servicer or you feel that you can't access that information, whether it's through an online portal or some other means, that could create problems for you, or thus you have to put in an additional layer of infrastructure in which to gather that information, thus taking you away from the things that really are going to make you money, which is either gathering um, for, um, information on assets or going out and raising money. Your servicer should be able to provide you with weekly investor calls and information. They should be able to provide you with an investor portal. When you sign up with us, our client relations manager, his name is Joe LaBruna, Joe will provide you with online credentials to um, go and into our investor portal and see what's taking place on your note, on your loan. Um, they should also be able to provide you with reporting. A lot of our reporting can be downloaded from our online portal. If you have a performing loan or if you have a settlement of some form, they should be able to provide you with remittance reports. 
tax monitoring and insurance monitoring, especially in the first phase, are very, very important. I get asked this question more and more. At about a year ago, I would get asked the question, you know, once, a, once every few weeks. I'm getting asked this question usually every day or two about tax monitoring. Because when you're buying a non-performing asset, one of the things that you're going to see in a lot of times on these tapes is they'll say zero taxes owed. Um, to me, that's a red flag. If you see zero taxes owed, that means that you should dive a little bit deeper into ascertaining whether those taxes are really paid current or if somebody bought the tax link. And thus, that creates a, an issue whether you want to really purchase that asset. But we have, we, we have outside vendors. We do not do it, but we have a vendor that will provide it. For $89 for the life of a loan, we'll provide tax monitoring for you. Insurance, making sure that you have insurance on the asset. If you, um, if you have a, uh, an asset in uh, Chicago right now and the, the pipes burst, if you purchase that asset and now you have insurance on it, now you're going to be able to collect upon that insurance. Um, there's a lot of different things that will that will get encompassed, but offering that is important. Sometimes you have to put a risk and reward whether you want to um, secure insurance or a tax monitoring or do it yourself. But we do offer those things. As I mentioned, we use um, Service Director, which is um, by Harlan, and we talked about a little bit. Uh, the reason being is because we're concerned with CFPB. Monthly billing statements. Monthly billing statements need to be sent. If you take a look at the CFPB regulations, and originally for mortgage, there are 697 pages of regulations. They were kind enough to summarize it down to a 97-page document. But contained within those, the, those pages are different things that need to take place. One of them is to make sure billing statements are sent and to make sure that certain things appear on those billing statements. Your servicer should be able to take care of that for you. A lockbox for payment processing, that should be a standard. There shouldn't be any really, there should, I mean, if they don't do that, that's it's a red flag. And that they're CFPB compliant. One of the things that's really important, and I see it as, you know, I travel different places or I speak at different events, is looking at making sure your servicer is licensed. If you go onto the NMLS directory, you can look and you can do the laundry list of, of licenses that we would hold. Um, I see you know, other servicers that one, uh, one of them has one license, but they, pra they service in all 50 states. Another one has 13 licenses. They, pra they service in, in all 50 states. That is going to be an issue if, it ever, if, it, if a borrower ever decides that they're going to make an issue out of it, if they're ever going to sue. And there was an interesting case, I think I might have sent it to you earlier today, Scott, Yeah. Um, about you know foreclosure. And in the state of Missouri, there's a, there, there, um, there is a case where they're saying that the, the, uh, the lender did not have a right to foreclose because they didn't um, have a clear chain of title. And they didn't have, they weren't licensed. Um, and there's a case, Finch up versus Maryland, about licensing. And the license, and they moved for a judgment, and they realized that the moving entity wasn't licensed. It's really, really important that you people that you're dealing with are licensed. That there are some um, it, services out there that are licensed in just a few states, everybody. So that's definitely important. Last thing you want to do is have your hard earned money and investment get. Uh, <laughs> not technically wiped out, but the right to foreclose go away because the service you've been working with isn't licensed in that state. And that's a, that's a huge, huge, huge thing that unfortunately we see a lot of investors struggle with. Yeah, there's a, um, I just put it up on my screen real quickly. Um, it's the Missouri wrongful foreclosure, they vacated the judgment. Um, and I can send this out to you, Scott, that's easy enough to do, but I cool. Remembered, I have it up on my screen, so I wanted to show that to everybody. Well, we don't, we don't, we only see the next slide, Joel. We don't see all three of your screens. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, okay, I real. Okay, well, I'll send this to you then. Sorry. Um, I pulled it up. I saw it. Um, <laughs> so your licensing is very, really important. 
Now, with us, what we what we'll do as far as getting started is there'll be initial contact, and generally that will be will be through me, and we'll have a conversation a little bit about what you're looking to do, how you're looking to achieve um, an investment objective, what your um, desires are in your investors, and what your tolerances are. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll give you a little bit of background, especially when you're new into the business. Um, I'm happy to spend some time with you, giving you some information on you know, what we do, how we do it, what's the, the timelines in, um, as far as boarding, what your, your expectations are, um, what, is re what is real and what is it, how long it really takes to, once from the, you purchase a note to the time that it gets boarded and now you're working with um, loss mitigation in which to resolve the delinquency. Generally, um, as I mentioned, we're in Costa Mesa, California. We have a variety of different opportunities that we present with regard to having access of data and reporting. Um, one of the things that's very important is once you decide that you're going to purchase a, a group of assets or even a single asset, is making sure you're, you provide the servicing information to the seller or the, or the previous servicer if you're service transferring something uh, assets from somewhere else. At that point in time, what will take place is we will then co uh, correspond and speak with the selling entity to make sure that we have everything and we start to put together a timeline so there's a smooth transition on the servicing. It's important that we establish a contract with you, making sure that we can act on your behalf. One of the things that's very important is, the, is that we have an understanding because they for conversation's sake, today is the 8th, or excuse me, the 9th. And we received notification that uh, you're going to be purchasing a pool of 10 assets and they're going to service transfer them. What we're going to do is we're going to reach out to the seller and or their servicer, and we're going to start what's referred to as the goodbye letter, getting that taken, making sure that we get a goodbye letter and that we can approve the goodbye letter, making sure that it, that goes out to the borrower and the, the information that's on that is correct. Generally that will go out right away once the transaction has been completed. At that point in time we'll also get a data file from the, the servicer and it contained within that data file will be up to 36 different data points so that we'll be able to board the loan correctly and we'll be in compliance. If during generally there's about a two to three week window that if we boarded, say, today the 9th, and then maybe maybe um, March 1st would be the service transfer date. During that time frame, a lot of work goes into making sure that the, the data file is correct, that we have all the information, that if there's anything that we're missing, that we kick it back to the previous uh, servicer and that they provide it to us. If they're unable to provide it to us because maybe they didn't have it, then we'll come back to you and say, look, we're missing the next due date and we're missing the interest rate. We can go and get that information or we'll, you can go into the collateral file and pull that information. But what we want to do is have all that information up front so on the first we can have a smooth boarding and then send out the hello letter. Now Joel, let me ask you a question real fast here. If somebody's working with like a, a custodian like Rich Monroe, CSC, you guys will also communicate with them to locate any information that may be missing or assignments or launches, things like that too, correct? Yes, and one of the things, it's a great point, we we work closely with CSA, we work very, work very closely with Leslie over at Richmond Monroe, um, getting all of that information, and part of that is when you're purchasing the asset, um, you know, you, you, can, you can go about your transaction in a variety of different ways. One way to ensure that you have all of the documents that you do need is to ask the seller for an exception report. And in essence, it, it is what is kind of what it's described to be. It's an exception. Of the collateral file, there are certain pieces of the puzzle that are going to be standard. The, the deed of trust, the mortgage, any assignments, the chain of assignments, whether there's one or three or five, the allonges, which is really the endorsement, making sure that you have all of that information. And in essence, in an accept, exception report, will tell you, look, of the collateral file, the custodian, so let's case in point would be Richmond Monroe, they will say we're missing an assignment from GMAC to, you know, the seller or 
something like that. So you'll know up front what you have to do in which to go and get those things um, replicated. So we do work closely with them. To do cool. Some. One of the things that we want when we board a loan is we would want, we want a soft copy of the collateral file. We never want a hard copy, but we always want a soft copy. Because as we go through, first of all, the boarding process, that's important, but also from the loss mitigation side, if we're negotiating. Or, we're, or, or there's two borrowers and we're negotiating with one and maybe there, it's a couple that's been divorced or it was a common law marriage or the two individual parties bought the uh, property. We want to make sure that we're able to verify exactly who's on title so our conversations are fruitful and if we have to go and speak with the second party, we, we do do so. If we have to skip trace to find the second party, we'll also do that. Part of the boarding process for us is when we board the loan, we will send out the hello letter. And three days later, we'll begin making phone calls on a non-performing loan. At that point in time, we will wait three days. If we haven't received or achieved right party contact, then we will begin to skip trace that asset to find out maybe the phone numbers are old, maybe you know, these aren't correct. And ultimately, our, our goal is to make right party contact. So skip tracing the, those for new numbers, especially when we're not making right party contact, is a key point of the outreach that we will perform. Our out, what outreach is going to be the critical piece of the puzzle if you're buying a non-performing loan. The, what we'll do is we will customize different campaigns. Each asset and group of assets is different. Sometimes we'll, we'll, we, we'll skip a phone campaign because we don't there's no phone numbers for that borrower. So what we're going to do right then and there is we're going to, you know, do a letter campaign and propose probably propose a field visit. But prior to that, we're going to skip trace that individual. Um, there's been cases when there was a property in Indiana and the it was vacant. We knew it was vacant. So there's no point in sending somebody out to the property unless we're looking for a, a status on the condition of the property. But we did skip trace that individual. We found out that he was living in Nevada. So we had a field visit, and we sent the field, visit, the field service agent to the, the individual in Nevada. We made contact with him, and we, get, we got him to agree to provide a, a signature for a deed in lieu on the asset. That's always so nice. It doesn't necessarily always mean that we're going to skip, we're going to send somebody out to the property. If we know somebody's there, I'm not going to waste uh, anybody's time, nor are we going to waste anybody's money. It's important to know exactly what you're doing and kind of adapt to your environment. Um, multilingual campaigns, um, we, we start, we're starting to see, back in 2009, 2010, we had a lot of uh, calls that were made to Puerto Rico, um, and we're starting to see a lot of those things kind of come back to us. So we have, we have uh, agents that speak, I think at this point in time, we have Vietnamese, Chinese, uh, um, Spanish, Farsi, and I think Portuguese. You're a multilingual company, huh? <laughs> we are. I mean, at one point in time, we had like, I think we had probably 12 languages and different dialects, Mandarin, Cantonese. We had people with all types of experience um, speaking there. Um, but generally, most of the um, bi bilingual needs generally come down to be Vietnamese and or Spanish. One of the things that's going to take place when you purchase a non-performing asset is you're going to determine which direction you want to go. Now, when I say direction that you want to go, well, how am I going to resolve that delinquency? And we break it up into a couple, two different buckets, the home retention and then liquidation. The home retention is obviously somebody who wants to retain their home or, or, or maintain the property. Um, on the home retention side, one of the important pieces when you buy, when you're doing your due diligence and you're going to buy a an asset or a group of assets is knowing whether the property is vacant or um, occupied. That's going to dictate a lot of your exit strategies. If you're buying a property that, that is occupied, then home retention is going to be on the table. Mm -hmm. And so it gives you greater options because what you can do, and we liken it to a waterfall, and so you'll be able to then utilize all the steps of the waterfall. 
if you're buying an asset that is vacant, that will limit you. And so therefore, there's not as many options available to you. It doesn't mean that it's not going to work. It just means that it's more of a streamlined process. With regard to home retention, generally the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to get, when we make right party contact, is we're going to ask somebody to, to, for reinstatement. Can you reinstate, your, reinstate your original payment? Okay, great, you can. Well, okay, now then we'll negotiate potentially um, a settlement of the arrearages. If they're unable to do so, then we're going to talk about potential forbearance or a repayment plan based upon um, the original payment. And if we speak to somebody and they say to us that they're an, unable to reinstate, they're not a you know, forbearance, that they really need a change in a modification in essence of, their, of the payment, then we're going to talk to them about a loan modification. But any of these programs, before we would move forward with anything, is we would, that, uh, with the exception of a reinstatement, but even in the case of a reinstatement, we want to gather financial information because we want to present that back to you. We're going to gather, we have, and we have a uh, checklist that we go through and we complete. And it talks about uh, income, potential income, um, just like anything else, if you're filling out for, for a mortgage or a credit card statement, we're going to gather that information. What are your expenses? What are your commitments? Um, things of that nature. And then we're going to present. We're going to come back to you as our client and say, "Look, we spoke with Mr. And Mrs. Jones. This is what they'd like to do, but you know, we agree, and maybe and we'll suggest some terms, or we'll say, you know what, they want to do this, but we really think that there's more money on the table. But ultimately, it's your decision to make. We'll present all the information to you, and then at that point in time, we'll provide counsel. But ultimately, we don't want to be able to make that decision on your behalf." We do not want a delegated authority. Ultimately, you're responsible. For, this is your property. This is your investor. This is your, um, you know, fund. And we want to be able to get a good sense of what you want done, and thus we will implement your, what you would like to be done. Ultimately, there's a couple other options that are available to us. Um, hardest hit funds. Hardest hit funds is a program that is used to help homeowners stay in their properties. It was originally created by the federal government, and the federal government designated money for for the 18 hardest hit funds, hardest hit states financially, plus the District of Columbia. And obviously, California had the largest amount of money. Um, District of Columbia had the smallest amount of money. Certain states, but the real piece of the puzzle was is that each state was given the opportunity to dictate how that that money was used. And the state of Illinois doesn't do it the state the way the state of Nevada would do it, or Arizona, or Rhode Island, things of that nature. Um, the state of Illinois stopped accepting hardest hit funds applications on September 30th of last year. Um, Rhode Island, at this point in time, has a little bit of money left, but they are they are they really aren't accepting any new applications. Each state's a little bit different. If you live in California, there is a commercial that runs generally every night. Um, between 11 and 11.30 on the news, and it's about um, keeping homeowners in their homes. And that is funded by the Hardest Hit Fund. So Hardest Hit Funds is a program that is utilized by each state differently, but ultimately when, when you boil it down, it's there's X amount of money that they want to deploy to keep people um, in their homes. And generally it's up to 24 months of delinquency that you can potentially get paid upon. In essence, what happens is you have a conversation with the the homeowner, and they would then apply. They have to apply to the hardest hit funds in their state, and then they'll generally about three weeks later, three to four weeks later, they'll get a designation whether they've been approved or denied, and then the money will get paid directly to the servicer, and thus the servicer will then pay the, the note holder or or the, or the bank on any monies collected. Um, hardest hit funds can be utilized in a variety of different ways. One of the ways in which we, re we recommend is that if somebody's in a hardest hit fund state when we're speaking with them, then we encourage them to apply for the hardest hit funds. We will help them and walk them through the application process, but we would want to know prior to doing any loan modification 
because that potentially can dictate what the arrearage is, what, what, what the unpaid principal balance is, things of that nature. One of the other um, methods in which to, for a, uh, a home retention option is a short refinance. And the short refinance, or, and there was the, the 1023 program, basically it's, it's a refinance that, in essence, once a borrower becomes current, they can then, at that point in time, refinance their, the mortgage. So there's a lot of different ways in which to, um, to create strategies in which to keep someone in their property. Now, let me answer your question, Joel. Um, with you guys collecting financial information, is that as a uh, kind of a, well, that's what I'm looking forward to say here. With the CFPB, a lot of loan officers, mortgage brokers are being held accountable for the borrower's financial situations and making sure that they're not putting them into an unaffordable loan and they be held accountable, what is it, up to three years? Is that a part of the reason that if uh, you've got a borrower who's ready to reinstate, you're going to go ahead and still ask for financials anyway, as well as kind of a uh, way to uh, stave off CFPB in case the borrower comes back and... Uh, Threatens that? Yes, absolutely. But really, ultimately, when it's said and done, when we're buying, and I put myself in, in everybody who's on the call's shoes, when you're buying a non-performing loan, and you're gonna, you want to get, you want it to reperform. Ultimately, it does you no good to get to modify somebody or to um, forbear or something. If, 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 30 days, 60 days down the road, they're just going to read the fault. It's better to know that information up front. And it's you know, ethically and morally, you're, by doing the right thing, you're actually doing the right thing for yourself and your investor. You know, sandbagging somebody is, you know, just doesn't make any sense, especially when you're buying the note at a discount. Right. Cool. Ultimately, we, want to, we, we all want to create the greatest return on investment possible, but it does no good if you... And my dad used to be in the car business. You know, he used, used to use the term lay, lay somebody away because ultimately you're just creating more problems down the road. And why create more? You're trying to solve problems, not create them as, as an investor. So, but compliance is always at the forefront of everything that we do. Um, CFPB, um, as I mentioned, um, uh, FDCPA, when we make a borrower, when we go and we make phone calls borrower, for borrower contact, Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, we're going to make those, make sure that those phone calls are made with it to be in compliant. We're not going to call anybody before 8 a.m. in the morning. We're not going to call anybody after 9 p.m. in the evening. We're not going to threaten anybody. A variety of different things that FDCPA covers, the mini Miranda, things of that nature. When making borrower contact, it's really, really important that you that you do not take this lightly because ultimately it can come back and haunt you. We had a client who um, they <laughs> it was on a second and they they sent out a letter a, a, a debt collection letter to them. They were doing it on their own. We were just doing the servicing, and the borrower had already paid off the mortgage. And they kept hounding him and kept hounding him. And it, it, had never, it had never reached the uh, individual who was making the contact. And ultimately, they, got, they retained an attorney. They sued him. And they settled for, for uh, $6,000. Now, granted, $6,000 is not a giant chunk of money, but that comes right out off your bottom line. So that affects everything that you do, plus the time and effort that you have to do to defend yourself or even just to negotiate it. Why do it? Why put yourself in that position? You know, you should. Our job as a servicer and a loss litigation firm is to solve problems, and hopefully that's what we do. Cool. Um, we talked a little bit. One of these strategies about field services. The field services is an important cog in the wheel of borrower contact. There are a few different ways in which to make borrower contact. Obviously, there is a letter campaign. There is a phone campaign. There are field services. Field services generally is utilized after a letter and phone campaign have not been able to bear fruit. A field service 
can go from as simple as going out to the property and taking three pictures, assessing how high the grass is, if there's any utilities hooked up to it, what condition the property is. Um, in essence, it's an um, external uh, BPO, for lack of a better term. Um, but what the way in which we use it is we utilize it with a field agent to have power, to create power contact. To go is always important to assess the condition of the property, and part of that condition is is there something somebody there. Obviously, the first goal is to make right party contact with somebody and get them to call into the into our uh, offices. But if nobody's there, there are other things that could bear fruit, meaning condition of the property taking a look at how high the grass is, utilities, but looking inside, is there, um, are there toys in the, in the backyard or in the front, in the living room? Um, is there, um, you know, are, is, at Christmas time, is there a, a, a tree that, that, that's uh, lit up? Um, things of that nature. Getting a sense of if the borrower is there, do they want to stay in the property? Is there a commitment to the community? That, that information, in turn, helps us to determine once we make right party contact with that individual you know how deeply committed they are to the property and also at the same time that helps us provide good information to our clients and thus to help you guys make better decisions that's one always of the, important. You know, the th one of the things that one of the things that we on a field service is a potential live warm transfer so if we go out there the field service agent knocks on the door and mrs jones comes to the door and says Mrs. Jones, um, I have Land Home Financial Services here on the phone. They'd like, like to speak with you, and he can potentially hand his cell phone to them. And now we have a live warm transfer where we're speaking directly to the borrower. So a lot of different ways in which the field service will provide benefit to us in the long run. And ultimately, the way we look at things at Land Home and the way our even our agreements are set up, is we align our interests with yours because ultimately if we can create value to you then we can share in that benefit. Um, we talked a little bit about loss mitigation on the retention side so I won't Scott and Scott will be able to have this PowerPoint for you um, later. On the liquidation side on the first it's, it's interesting um, just because how things have kind of evolved over the last few years. There's a retention option, there's a liquidation option. On the liquidation option, it's a little bit more narrow in scope. If the property is vacant, then most likely what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking for a deed in lieu. We're going to try and avoid foreclosure. And thus, the Cash for Keys program kind of dovetails into a deed in lieu if somebody is in the property and is not able to stay or doesn't want to stay. Sometimes people say, you know, this has been a this has kind of been bad, the whole thing surrounding this house. I want a fresh start. I want to move. And one of the things that's important is to make sure that that property, because it's your property, if they're going to agree to a deed in lieu, is in good condition, meaning the copper is there, the wiring is there, the countertops are there, cabinets, vanities. Um, there's not cement poured into the toilets. All of that is very expensive to repair. Uh, just pick, you know, Pick a night and go on to HGTV, and you'll see that people doing rehabs and things of that nature of what people have done to properties, and it'll lay it all off for you in dollars and cents. On the, with the liquidation side, we see more short sales as it pertains to seconds than we really do as it pertains to first. It's not saying that we don't see a lot of short sales on the first side, but we infinite probably by you know a factor of three we see more short sales on the second side most of the time on the liquidation if we're going to make right party contact with somebody it's going to be a deed in lieu and it's important when we're negotiating a deed in lieu to have that collateral file that we talked about at the beginning and the reason it's important is because contained in that collateral file generally will be a title report if there's not a title report then we're going to suggest that we run it because the last thing we want to do is get somebody to sign a deed in lieu and find out there's, they have a, a lien or a judgment against them, and therefore now all of a sudden we sign the deed in lieu, we file it, and now we're out, we're out of first position. Now let me add something to that, Joel. You guys have always been really good with, if there is a second, negotiating with a second, if it's something that I don't own, if it's a second behind my first, 
negotiating a pay down, a settlement with a, plus any other liens on the property. You guys also will do that as well. Correct. And you know, it's it's interesting. Over the years, each one's a little bit different. I mean, to get an IRS lien um, removed, it generally takes about 30 days, and you can negotiate with them as long. And generally, the, the premise is, is that the borrower can't receive any um, financial benefit from the deed in lieu or, the, or a short sale. So IRS will release if in order to help clear the title. Um, HELOCs generally. You, know, you can settle for five to ten percent uh, on the five five to ten cents on the dollar uh, credit card debt things of that nature um, obviously there's su su certain super liens that supersede that you can't um, but like for instance if you're going if you have a property in Florida so you have a safe you know the, the safe harbor law there so you, in essence, what that means is even though the home, the HOA may have a judgment for eighty thousand dollars, so just say, all they can really uh, collect on because of the because of the law is twelve months of HOA fees. It's important to have an understanding and a delineation of what's taking place, um, and, and second liens sometimes can be a problem or or, or not, and sometimes it'll it'll kill the deal and you have to move to foreclosure, but a lot of times you can negotiate these things off and make the transition smoother. Generally, as a rule, um, if you took 10 loans and you asked me, well, what do you, is, what do your historical numbers bear out? Out of 10 loans, we're going to get two to three loans that will get some retention option. We will get about three to potentially four that will be some liquidation option, and the balance will need to end up going to foreclosure. Now, foreclosure is a um, tool to be used to spur somebody who's been ducking and hiding to negotiate, and ultimately, foreclosure is a necessary means in which to return investment to your investors or whether it's your IRA or just to yourself. Ultimately, you, 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 if you're uncomfortable with foreclosing on a property, then maybe that's the time that once you get to that, that you sell that asset off to somebody else because you are going to be involved in a foreclosure if you're going to be in this business. Um, one of the other things that we do do um, on the non-performing loans is we, we, have, we can do analysis on the pools, and generally um, on larger pools that we, we take in, we will run a scrub and we utilize core logic for it and we'll look make sure that the assets are um, in the, within the statute of limitations. If they aren't, if it's debt recovery, we're going to come back to you and say, give you the information on that, things of that nature. So you have an understanding of what type of assets you have and what the exit strategies are going to be for them. Uh, we do do, we also have a, a group that does REO services, which you know, could be as simple as minor repairs um, or if you need to remarket a property. This is a, a kind of a, uh, a view of what our borrower portal, what our borrower portal looks like. And contained within the borrower portal will be direct, it's direct access to all our customer service information. Um, you'll also you'll be able to have access to payments, any, any payments made, whether it's the data file that we received from the previous service or anything that takes place on our watch, the loan history. On a performing side, we want we're going to always want to advocate two things. Once we modify a loan, we want to prove that modification in writing. Absolutely, do not do any modifications that are not in writing because they they're only as good as the paper that they're written on. And thus, um, if we don't have it, then the, the borrower can walk away, and now you're back at square one. If we're negotiating with somebody and we do do a modification, we want that thing documented. Potentially, if we put in a clawback clause, and a clawback clause is that similar to what took place in 2009 and 10 with HAMP, that we'll do six months' worth of payments. Once you, you make six months' worth of payments, then the modification becomes permanent. But up until that point, it's temporary. It's not locked in because if you default, we're going to go back to the original terms. Um, but ultimately, if we do do a modification, then we're going to also want 
is set up with an ACH, and that's automatic payment that takes place. The reason we do, we advocate that and advocate it strongly is because if your payment is due on the fifth of the month, for conversation's sake, and that payment, go, we, they go to, to pull that out of their account, and they're not able to do so. There are insufficient funds. We're going to know right away that we have an issue with that loan. If we're way, if, the, if that person is making payments and it's due on the fifth, well, you know, we got to give them a grace period because you know, you know, the third was a, was a Sunday and maybe we didn't get it. Now all of a sudden, you you add days on top of uh, on top of what's taking place. This way you know exactly what's taking place right there, right now. Um, also in, inside the investor portal, you'll be able to get standardized reports that we have, customized reports, um, things of that nature. And ultimately when you're sitting up awake at 1.30 in the morning and you can't think, uh, can't sleep, and you're thinking about your, your, uh, your, your non-performing notes, if you want to, you can go online and access that information right then and there. So the online portal provides a lot of um, information. We have a client relations manager. I think I mentioned earlier his name is Joe LaBruna. And Joe's job is to make sure that you are, have access to the information. Communication is key. I read an article this morning, and they were talking about, um, you know, uh, what does Mike Krzyzewski, who's the, coach, the Duke basketball coach, they asked the uh, the, the star freshman Okafor, they asked him, what is the thing that my coach tells you the most and he stresses the most to you guys as a team? And he said, communication. And it struck me as I was going through exactly what we do, um, communication is key. Everybody can adapt and, and overcome certain things, but when you're in a, if you're sitting in the dark, if you're not being able to access information or communicate with somebody, especially when it's dealing with your or somebody else's money, that creates problems. And thus, the, you know, we I think we've made great strides with our portal and our client relations um, group in order to make sure our clients have an understanding of what's taking place, and if they have any questions, they can access that information. That's huge. What, uh, we, I talked a few minutes ago really about um, retention, and I talked about liquidation. And one of the things that we did, I haven't really touched on, which I think is really important, is what's going to take place on your asset is you're going to end up having to foreclose, and you're going to have to deal with bankruptcies. And thus, we've, um, we have a relationship with a law firm out of Seattle called Weinstein and Riley. Weinstein and Riley has been in has been practicing creditors law for the last thirty years. The managing partner is a gentleman by the name of Bill Weinstein. Whoops, I hit the um, and they Bill Weinstein and Bill has created the firm um, that spans from coast to coast. As you can see um, on my the PowerPoint we're, they're in all fifty states. Um, they have brick and mortar and, rich, and quite a few, and then they have uh, also attorneys. These are their attorneys. These aren't, you know, from a network or things of that nature. Um, you're going to have to deal with things, and I'm going to guess, let's, for conversation's sake, you're probably going to buy assets that are going to be in Indiana, in Illinois, in Ohio, um, Tennessee, Virginia, Georgia, Florida. As you can see by the map, um, those are all Weinstein and Riley states that they have their, their council covering. Weinstein and Riley, as I mentioned, was been, been, um, practicing law for 30 years. They are the largest bankruptcy, creditors bankruptcy firm in the country. Uh, besides working on behalf of your assets, they have a whole group that works on behalf of Nation Star and Green Tree and other very large servicers. So it's not, you know, one of the things someone once asked, someone I usually ask me is, well, you know, if I only have, you know, three loans, if I only have, you know, five loans, you know, will, will you, can I have them service with you? And the answer is always, absolutely. Because if we do our job right and we're able to provide you with the return on your investment, those three loans will become six loans, those five loans will become ten loans, and therefore everything will then grow 
and we want to be part of that growth. One of the, uh, with, when working with Weinstein and Riley, one of the things that um, on the foreclosure side that's very critical is the different services that are provided. Because when you have to move to foreclosure, the last thing you want to do is start to be able to do, have to do your research at that point in time and figure out exactly what needs to take place. Um, they have collectively, they have, uh, uh, besides the 100 years of experience, I mean, I'm on the phone with them daily working on a variety of different things but they handle the full spectrum of foreclosure services and, and also eviction services nationwide. One of the things that's really important, as we talked about earlier, is the collateral file. When you purchase that asset, contained within that collateral file are going to be different pieces of the puzzle. And especially whether you do loss mitigation or you have to move to foreclosure, in essence, the collateral file proves that you're the owner. And in order to move to foreclosure or a lawsuit with regard to a promissory note, because ultimately that's what a mortgage is, a promissory note, you're going to need these items. And that's the mortgage, the of trust, the note itself, the complete chain of assignments, complete chain of allonges, obviously a servicer, because you can't move, if you move to foreclosure without the servicer, that's going to be a whole, especially in judicial states, payoff statements, reinstatement letter or quotation, and a demand letter. All of these things are going to be should be within the collateral file. You should should not move to foreclosure until you have all of these things. And the reason being is that you don't want to forestall the process. Each state is different. In the state of California, prior to the Homeowners Bill of Rights, um, foreclosure generally was able to take place between 130 and 180 days. Now it's like 180 to 210 with the Homeowners Bill of Rights. It's still pretty quick. If you go across the country to the judicial states, as some judicial states, if you have a contested foreclosure in the state of Florida, you're looking potentially at you know 600 days. If you go to New York, um, you're looking at two to three years. So it's important that when you purchase these assets, that you have an understanding of what the expectations are, but more so that if you, you have an understanding that you're going to have to eventually move the foreclosure, that when you do move the foreclosure, you have all the pieces of the puzzle in place so you can move forward unimpeded. And that, that, that is a very important piece of the puzzle, especially when, when you're using, utilizing the foreclosure process to um, clear the title on your asset. Um, they have the foreclosure process management, which what we what they do is they have a client consultation, which I would be on that phone call with you, um, to talk about the first legal documents, what the demand process is, if we have to send out a note of intent to foreclosure or a demand letter, what that does, what what that all means. If you kind of a judicial state is obviously different than a non-judicial state. If you look at the map in the United States and you take from Chicago East, most of those states, if not all of them, are all judicial states to foreclose. If you take Chicago West, then most of those states are trustee or non-judicial states. Therefore, the foreclosure process moves faster. I think Scott likes to joke that, you know, in Texas they do everything fast, fast, <laughs> uh, fast executions and fast foreclosures. Um, and Texas obviously is a non-judicial state. Now, one of the things that you that you're always going to have to contend with is bankruptcy. And bankruptcy is a, is some of the your assets that you might look on in a pool have already been in foreclosure. Excuse me, in uh, bankruptcy, they may have been dismissed, or they might be ongoing, or they might have filed and and, and not followed through with it. But it's always important that if it's, having an up if you have a bankruptcy that you address it um, and address it head on thus utilizing a firm and I just um, had a client uh, who had to file the, a bunch of motions for relief and stay uh, proof of claims things of that nature so Weinstein and Riley does, does a very good job with that and the reason in my next slide you're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about why they're really good at that and one of the things that's important is that having an understanding that you're being represented in the right way. Now, we talked about having an online portal earlier for 
your loss mitigation work and your servicing. To my knowledge, Weinstein and Riley is the only firm in the country that has an online portal where you can access information on your foreclosure and bankruptcy. That's Q. I don't know if you've ever had to go through foreclosure before, but getting a attorney on the phone because they don't make you know, their money is all is is made um, not is, is doing the doing the work, not giving you an update on what's taking place on the one. And having secure block, they and uh, Weinstein and Riley created secure blocks. And in essence, what it is, it's an online portal that you can go in 24/7 and view what's taking place. Now, it is um, encrypted. It's PCI compliant. They are they are SSA 16 compliant as as is Land Home. Um, so you never have to worry about it, um, having any data. Well, data breaches are a way of life, as we all know. But having this, this is a one other a level of security. So there's data breaches and things of that nature are uh, forestalled. And contained within the portal are all the legal pleading, demand letters, any types of correspondence. If a payment comes in, you'll be able to see the type of payment, if it's a wire, if it's a check, there's an image of it, any notes, things of that nature. And then you're able to uh, create and pull down reporting from Blossom. This is a slide that um, kind of gives you like a little bit of understanding of what you're able to access. Um, when you log into Blossom, you'll be able to see if there's a proof of claim filed, if there is what court jurisdiction has been filed in. If you want a copy of it, you'll be able to pull down a copy of it. If, you're, if you have the notice of the demand letter has been um, sent out, you'll be able to access that and pull down a copy of it and print it for yourself. Blossom gives you access to information. Again, it raises the level of communication, which is really the key component. As we all go through the, the investor side and we purchase non-performing assets and we try and resolve the delinquency, communication is key, having an understanding of what's taking place and making sure that you're in compliance. Regulation is, is because, as because of Dodd-Frank and what took place in 2008 and 2009. And, um, compliance and um, being able to secure the information and provide that, that you're, you're being fair to the borrower um, is very important. And we feel that Landholm and Weinstein and Riley via that we're able to do so. Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of insight, um, we have our chief servicing officer. Her name is Taji Singh, and Taji has been um, in the business for, I think, over 20, 25 years. She has worked at Option One. She's a CPA by training. She has worked for um, uh, the uh, the Bank of America, she's worked for Freddie Mac, she's worked for the um, FDIC. She brings a culture of compliance and competence to our facilities. And at that point, when she put it, she's created um, a team of professionals that we operate in a method that um, we're able to implement different strategies, but at the same time, making sure that at all Time, everything is done within compliance because the last thing any of us want to do is get a, a knock on the door with a process server saying that you have a CFPB complaint because ultimately what used to happen is if you had a complaint you would get a mimeograph page that would come in the mail and someone file a complaint and you have to respond to it now what they do with CFPB is they actually serve you <laughs> it's a much more uh, daunting process and the fines are not um, uh, cheap. Yeah, I was trying to say nominal. Yeah, the first the, the first fine, if I remember correctly, is is twenty five hundred dollars. The second would be five thousand, and then it goes to ten thousand per incident from there. So, if I if you walk away with anything today, I hope that you walk away with the idea that, that you have to make sure that you safeguard your investment, that you do that you work with a vendor network that has your interests aligned with theirs 
and that compliance is an important piece of the puzzle because at, when it's all said and done, you, you don't want to think about certain things that you should. For instance, if you're driving your car, you want to make sure there's oil in, 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 in the car. You don't want to have to worry about checking your oil all the time. And in, in essence, it should be a no-brainer. Working with a, a, a competent group of vendors will make your life easier and thus free up your opportunities to acquire investor money and assets. Um, this is my contact information. I'm available if you'd like to reach out to me via email or a phone call. However I can be of assistance, I'd welcome the opportunity. I appreciate you listening to me today. And if you have any questions, obviously, uh, I think we, there's a give and take that's with it. You can throw some questions. Yep. But I appreciate your talk, everybody's time today. Great, then. Thanks, Joe. Uh, a couple questions that come across here is uh, from Ken. It says, is Land Home both licensed to service and license to collect to do workouts in all 49 states. Joel? Mr. Markovitz. Yes. <laughs> Could you, guys, you, you guys are licensed. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> The question was, are his land on both licensed to service and collect in all 49 states? Is that correct? Yes. We have, we have a uh, debt collector's licenses and a, the ability to service in all 49 states in the District of Columbia. Okay. Question, next question is, do servicers need any certification to deal with the hardest hit fund programs? In certain states, you do. In others, you do not. Um, if you're, if each one's a little bit different. In California, there is no such designation. And in um, Arizona, Nevada, there, are no, there is no such designation. Okay. Uh, Karen asked a question, what's the fee structure for the services? Karen, you're going to want to reach out to Joel because it's going to depend on exactly what you want them to do for you. Uh, we won't have Joel go through the a la carte menu here. I would highly suggest once you close on something to reach out to Joel. Uh, Eric asks, what state are you not licensed in? I believe that it is New Jersey. Okay. Um, I would have to verify it, but I believe it's New Jersey. Um, but, um, but we, in, with the, if we have any assets that are in New Jersey, we have a land home being an originator. We have $4.3 billion of mortgages that have been originated, and we utilize our subservicing relationship with um, Dover Mule, which is out of Chicago. For the for the, the states that we weren't licensed in, so theoretically we can we can do business in every state. Cool. Um, all right. Yes, Stephen, they do service second mortgages. Um, let's see here. Kevin, you will want to touch base with uh, Joel regarding that as uh, as far as fees. We just covered that. Um, hang on a second here. What uh, I can't say about the the fees, um, we do. We have success-based pricing, so if we're able to secure a modification, if we're able to secure a deed in lieu, um, upon success, if you win, we win. If not, we're, we align our interests with yours. Okay. Kathy, we just covered your question. Um, all right. Uh, Joel, you want to repeat your email address again? Oh, sure. Um, my email is j joel j o e l dot markovitz at l h f s dot com. I just pulled it back up there for you. Sorry. That's fine. Don't worry about. I'll email out to everybody that registered. Um, joel dot markovitz at l h loan servicing dot com or joel dot markovitz at l h f s dot com. Cool. For those that are wanting to copy this presentation, Joel has emailed me his PowerPoint. I will be uploading that to the slide share files that we use. And then also, once I upload the recording of this video to Vimeo, I'll be putting a link to that PowerPoint along with all Joel's contact information as well for you. All right. Um, let's see here. Covered that already. Uh, Michelle, Drew, let's see here. Uh, what's the, when is the process? 
when in the process of acquiring and working with us, should we run a tower report? You guys should run an O and E report prior to closing on the deal, everybody, because you got to see what's available, what's behind your note. Um, for the most part, make sure it's still about first. Okay. Frank asked a question: If I board a pool of loans, can I work some of them out my own? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding. <laughs> Questions: If he buys some notes, can he do some of the loss mitigation himself as far as like borrow or reach out? Oh, on his own loan? Sure. Yeah. What we will do is we'll we'll um, uh, provide him with an app. We'll ask him to execute an affidavit, um, basically holding us harmless. If we, if there's any type of uh, contact that takes place that creates an issue, yeah, but yeah, not a problem. You're you're going to definitely want to touch base with them to make sure you're doing everything right, Frank. And no, Michelle and Drew, not a full title report, an O and E report, ownership and encumbrances. All right, let's see here. Okay, Alan, you're going to need. I don't understand your question. What you're talking about? Uh, I, one of the big things I always budget. I'm going to throw in a thousand bucks per note per twelve months. Uh, for just general servicing. As Joel mentioned, depending on the route that you go, whether it's deed blue or foreclosure, there's going to be additional costs along the way. So uh, I like to throw in. Uh, okay, then what? Uh, anyway. I always throw a thousand bucks in anywhere from three thousand to five thousand for foreclosure costs and attorney fees along the way as part of my uh, budgeting. Uh, Sam asked the question how does the lockbox for payment processing work? That's a great question. Um, basically, what we'll do is if a payment comes in, whether it's a check or if it's an ACH, if we have a lockbox arrangement with a bank called uh, SunWest Bank in Irvine, California. And so the payment comes in, and we wait for it to clear. Generally, it takes two days for it to clear. Um, if it's a wire, obviously, it clears right away. And then at that point in time, a remittance is created, and it gets wired to the investor. Cool. And a statement gets emailed to them. Or if you want, that you can actually apply the payments towards your bill, correct? Of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> you guys need to pay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, hey, that's the last of the questions here. I want to thank Joel for taking time on his busy schedule to spend uh, an hour 15. I know you're getting ready to head out to Vegas for uh, a big servicing convention, so we won't take more of your time. Uh, Everybody, one quick reminder there, you will, uh, Joel, you'll be coming to St. Louis as well in March, correct? Yes, and, uh, yeah, and then uh, I think San Antonio. Ah, for the mastermind later in March, that's correct. We'll get those dates out. Um, you're welcome, Bob. Let's see here. Let me go through anything. Uh, once again, there's that. As always, this call will is recorded. We'll be having it uploaded later tonight, if not tomorrow morning, ready for replay. So. Have a great evening. Thanks for taking time on the Monday note. We'll catch you next Monday. Joel, thank you very much, buddy, and uh, I'll talk to you tomorrow, buddy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Be well. Thanks. Bye.